Rabbi Lau says that I always said that we have uh, three different circles. Every community leader needs to work in these three circles. First of all, rabbinical values and rabbinical uh, role is an issue of inheritance. You learn it from someone else. I learned from a rabbi, Yedidia Franco. He is the only person in the state of Israel with three medals, medals of honor from the army. We're talking about a rabbi, Rabbi Franco. To live back then with Yitzchak Shamir and Menachem Begin and David Ben Gurion and to be part of the uh, committee of neighborhoods. And he was a Rabbi a Chassid, a Gur Chassid. I learned in Kiryat Motzkin until I was married. And I saw that a person cannot stay in his close area. He needs to look out. And so I'm talking about three circles. The first close circle, the people come every day to the synagogue, pray, don tefillin, and that's the first circle. Rab Rabbi needs to give the lectures, teach, answer questions. That's what I did in Tel Aviv. That's what I do in Tel Aviv. Even if you have other things you know, overseas, but you can't stop treating the first circle. And you have all the different ideas there, all the different issues, personal issues, family issues, issues of education. How do you deal with that first circle? And then there is the second circle. Jews of Shabbat, we call them, traditional Jews. And the rabbi is talking about those who are not 100% observant. And he's talking, Rabbi, now about all these definitions of chiloni, secular. And Rabbi Lau says, I'm secular. And what he is explaining is that chiloni, secular, is whoever is not a kohen. That's the original definition. So the rabbi here is trying to talk about the definitions that are problematic. But in our terms, traditional, is someone who comes on Shabbat and on Chagim and festivals and on days of memorial and he observes some of the uh, precepts, the mitzvot, but not everything. This is the second circle. Rabbi Lao says that he once came to a synagogue that most the people in the synagogue were part of the traditional sector. And the issue there that was uh, on the people's agenda was how do you make sure that the children will continue to go to observant or religious or traditional schools? Because they know that when a child goes to one of these traditional religious observant schools, then there's no, they won't drive on Shabbat with their car. And that's the way to treat these second, the second uh, circle mainly education of the second generation and the third generation to keep the tradition. And then there's the third cycle. I call them not the Jews of Shabbat, the Jews of the High Holidays. They come on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and on the Memorial Days for their parents. Uh, 
So how do I reach them? I'm the leader of the community. I need to reach also the third circle. So one of the ideas that Rabbi Lau here is talking about is treating those who are sick and ill, those who aren't coming to work because they're sick. According to the rules that uh, Rabbi Lau started in his synagogue, the community has to report to the rabbi if someone's not coming to work, if someone is ill. And then the rabbi comes to visit him, comes to visit him at home. And this person is surprised. Why is this rabbi coming to me? It's a Jew who doesn't come a lot for synagogue. He doesn't know what the ideas of Purim is or any other ideas and precepts. And the rabbi is supposed to explain to him that it's an important precept, an important mitzvah to visit those who are sick, to visit those who are ill. Rabbi Lau says that he used to, and he tells the people, he tells this ill person, I saw that you have a mezuzah here at the entrance to your home. But in this room where you're sleeping in, there's no mezuzah. And uh, the person who's ill asks the rabbi, do we need in every room? And the rabbi tells them, yes, in every room. And slowly you bring in more mezuzot, more holiness into the house. And when someone is ill, they're open for gratitude. They're open to to new ideas, and this exists. And the person says to the rabbi, ask the shamash of the synagogue to help. And Rabbi Lau says how simple this is. Sivan asks about the fourth circle. He's mentioning only three circles, and the Sivan here is asking about the fourth circle someone who doesn't even really want to come close at all to the synagogue. Rabbi Lau says, it's when I come to a school, for example, and there I meet people who are in this fourth circle who don't come to the synagogue at all. I come there different times. Once they used to say to me, come Holocaust Day, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I said, it's not only for Holocaust Remembrance Day, I'm I didn't come out of the ghetto just for Holocaust Remembrance Day. And Rabbi Lau says that uh, he asked to come on the beginning of the year, on Rosh Hashanah, that time. And he comes and talks to them about the ideas of the ten days of atonement. Invite me for the holy holidays. I come and I talk to these people the way, in a language that they understand. There's no uh, high school where I come. Rabbi Lama is talking about his visits to schools which are considered secular, non-observant. Also here in Modi'in, I used to visit the schools. I used to hear lectures about the ideas, the Jewish ideas. And the principal says, the rabbi says, you should understand that we also have Arab students here. Rabbi Lau uh, here is talking about the history of that uh, school. In the beginning it was uh, all Jewish. 
Sivan is asking about the fact that Rav Lau is invited to events also because he's very he's a very good speaker. How much does a rabbi need to be a good speaker? Is it something that you could learn? Is it something that you could really uh, get better in? You're the pro. I didn't learn it at all. Nowhere. I don't know. There are a few tips. I'll give you three tips. We're writing. The first tip is that the first page of the lecture throw into the garbage because the first page is all, I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't know that I needed to talk, and I didn't think, and I didn't prepare anything. That's the first page of the lecture. Put that away. You're standing in front of a public. You're standing in front of a crowd. Forget about all these apologies. Second thing is, when we were kids, and we were supposed to write a, uh, an essay, is how do you start? That was the first question. How do you start? Even writing a letter to your brother is always the question of how do how do we start? My suggestion is, and believe me, it works. Don't think too much. Think, but not too much. Not how exactly I should open the pe the letter, but how do I complete it? How do I end the lecture, the letter? Where am I trying to reach? What is the goal of the lecture or the letter. That's the main thing, not how to open. And you know how to land, so to speak. And you don't talk like the historical speaker at the Zionist Congress who continued talking until only the chairman was still in the uh, hall. When you think ahead about the end of the lecture, you won't get into that situation that people are saying, he talks nicely, but come on, enough already. He doesn't know how to uh, end his speech. You won't reach that. So my second tip is, think about how to complete your speech. And the third thing and the central issue I want to tell you tonight, I hear many lectures, and many times the opening is, is irrelevant. The end needs to be the punchline. But the content needs to be needs to be in a way where when the husband, for example, goes back and uh, let's say his name is Yankee and he says, Yankee, where were you? You were in synagogue? You came home late? What was there? Ah, there was a conference. They talked a lot. No, what did they talk about? It was about Shabbat. Yankee says, so who talked? Uh, this rabbi. So what did he say? Um, I, he said something about Shabbat. Something. So what did he say? Uh, that it's important to, to observe the Shabbat. A lecturer needs to understand that the crowd goes home and they need to go home with something, something concrete, something, an idea, a commentary. Uh, a statement, something that they can go home with. Don't just talk about something. Talk, talk inside. Talk, give insights. So these are three main and central tips. Open without all the nonsense. End. The ending is important, the completion. And give them something that they could go home with. If you're talking in front of high school kids, I uh, give out uh, synagogue. Uh, I give out sidurim, books of prayers, to non-observant schools. It's Twenty-six years already. Every second grade, 
after the Chagim, they come and receive the Torah, which is a book of the stories of the Bible, of Bereshit. There are a few verses there, and I give these students these books. That stage, they're eight years old. Sometimes I see them 20 years ago, when they, 20 years later, sorry, when they come to uh, submit to marriage. And some of them say, I don't forget you. I don't forget you when you gave me the Torah, this leaflet of Torah, the book of uh, the, sto the stories from Torah, so, so and so years ago. And we're talking here about 28 years old Tel Avivians who come to submit to marriage. And this ceremony that took place so many years ago, we're talking about dozens, hundreds of kids are that just receive little books, but understand how much this is significant for them. Many of them even many of them even don't have names that are resemble names from the Bible. <laughs> Rabbi Lau mentioned that many of the kids don't even have uh, Jewish traditional names but nevertheless it's a chance that 15 minutes that you talk to them you tell them a story 20 years later they remember it that's this fourth circle that you're talking about or even we talk about in the Haggadah, the fifth, the fifth son who doesn't even come to the Seder. We're talking about communication, communication inside the synagogue, in the synagogue, where it's not only a holy place, but it's a place of discussion, of uh, sometimes controversy, and the rabbi today is even a, some sort of psychologist, a coacher, a uh, counselor. She could tell us about the complexity of being a leader of a community, not just a simple rabbi. It's very personal. Every different case is different. You have to know the people, the homes, the families, before you enter every situation. Sometimes I receive questions, personal questions, family-related questions. I don't answer until I hear both sides. And people respect this. I tell them another thing. A small... If someone has a small sore, no one answers them on the phone what exactly to take. You need to see it, even if it's a small sore. One might be allergic to something. Maybe there's a different solution. So if in some such a small sore, you need to come and see, to understand, to see. Here we're not talking about just a little sore, we're talking about people's lives families sometimes of continuing a family life or separating or fathers and children parents and children you have to see the patients you invite them but what if you only hear one side you didn't hear anything if you hear only one side it could even be the the opposite of the truth you have to hear the other side maybe you'll hear the other something totally opposite don't do anything quick. Don't give suggestions without hearing the whole story. Sit with the person. Sit with two sides. And not just once. That's why it's good that there are different roles that help in this. And I want to tell all the young rabbis, don't be scared that there are 
disputes inside the synagogues, between the families in the synagogue. Quiet, there's only in the cemeteries. No one fights with each other. Only in the cemeteries there is quiet. Equality, that everyone is exactly the same, that's not something that exists. Unity is something that exists. You need a heart that hears this, what is written. But it's an ear that hears, not a heart that hears. Well, the heart is sensitive, the heart understands. Why does a heart listen? Why does King Solomon say that a heart needs to listen and hear? Also in the uh, tractate of Avot, it talks about this. Now talking about the communication, communications media. How do we uh, deal with the media, what we uh, see in the media, what we hear in the media? I used to be a reporter, a uh, correspondent to uh, the uh, issue of Haredim, of ultra-Orthodox. And when someone asked me, why did you stop dealing specifically with uh, the issues of the uh, religious sector, I said that my feeling was that there in Israel there are reporters that are involved with the uh, religious and religious who talk to the media. But that's not the real connection. It's not the, the true connection. It's just this connections between a few specific observant Jews who are connected to the media and the media. You, the rabbi, you are connected to the media. Is there anything different in the way that the media sees Judaism? Do they see it as something that bothers, something that is in the way? Or, as we know, sometimes there are places where the media cooperates. First of all, media is a big word. Tommy Lapid of blessed memory, before he came into uh, politics, he didn't uh, have any religious education, nowhere. He was uh, distant from religion. On the army radio, Galeitzel, 40 years ago, he had an hour, which was about, it was called Lechol Adot, All Opinions. It was a live program on the radio. He invited me to uh, get online, asked if I can come and be interviewed for an hour. What do you want to talk about? He says, someone told me that you're publishing a book about Judaism and halacha, actual precepts and rules and Judaism. I heard that it's in print. And I want to talk to you about that. I came and told him, I never heard of you. I never heard of you as something that is involved in to talk an hour about Judaism. But 
we have to understand and know. Tommy Lapid answered that the gossip and everything else in the media, that's nothing really that interests me. But my, it's my children. Rabbi Lau was talking about uh, the daughter of Tommy Lapid, who sat shiva and was mourning for the daughter who was killed in a uh, traffic accident. Rabbi Lau was mentioning that when Tommy Lapid uh, came into politics, he went against the kashrut, the, uh, all the different uh, options of kashrut. He spoke against it. But he said that the chief rabbinin is okay. He was very harsh against religious issues. Rabbi Frankel, my father-in-law, said, Rabbi Frankel said once, he said to me, Israel, all the tools that Moshe put into the Mishkan and the tabernacles, all the different tools, the, the, the menorah, the table, they were for an hour and for generations. Because also in the first temple and the second temple, everything was, all the utensils, everything was for an hour and for generations. But there was one that was only for an hour and not for generations, the two trumpets. Why? Because they are the media, the communications. They used to use it like Morse to bring everyone together. And when they had two trumpet uh, sounds, it was time to go. When Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to call in the whole uh, nation to join together and to listen to him, to gather, they knew how to use the trumpets to call everyone in. These tools, said Rabbi Frankel, were only for that hour, for that time, not for generations. When the generation is in the uh, the desert, and everything is central, everyone is together, and the trumpets are heard, all the uh, tribes hear and come together. But once you come into the land of Israel, and the, the people are sitting from the border with Egypt until the border in the north, go use these two trumpets. You can't do that. They were good back then but not for generations. For example, in the time of uh, when we had to define when uh, the beginning of the month was, the media that you're talking about, Sivan, has the idea of now. The idea of today, now. It's the trumpets of today. If there's an opportunity to write something, write it, even if it's a newspaper that you don't agree with. It's important, it's an opportunity. These are the trumpets. Where are the uh, where are your powers from? Where are your strengths from? Do you go to so many uh, synagogues, so many lectures, so many schools? Where is the where's your power? Where does it come from? What, where should other rabbis 
get their strength from? What is your suggestion? What is your tip in that issue? And where do you get your powers from? First of all, you know, you should know that getting old is a process and it needs its time. I'm so busy that I don't have time to get old. And the crowd is cheering, of course, happy and agreeing with that. The simple uh, examples, yesterday, yesterday on Sunday, I went to Holland. I just came back four o'clock this morning. Why was, in, why was I in Holland? I went to Amsterdam and they took me an hour and a half drive to Nijmegen. Many uh, Israeli and Jewish students are there. I was there only once when the mayor agreed to bring a few Jews back. To bring them and to give them uh, the, a synagogue which was taken over by the Nazis. 60 years there was no synagogue then, there in Nijmegen. There are many students there, many Jews, many Israelis. They wanted to come to synagogue at least on Yom Kippur, and there was no synagogue. 60 years later, 60 years later, they invited me as a chief rabbi of Israel to the inauguration of that synagogue. There were a few Jews there, and they wanted a Torah scroll. They contributed, and they wrote a Torah scroll. The whole city contributed, and they wanted to hold a uh, ceremony. They wanted the chief rabbi of Israel to come and bless the uh, participants of the ceremony. They wanted him to hold uh, the Sefer Torah. The day before I came there, it was 15 years ago, they told me on the phone that while they were cleaning the synagogue, this synagogue that was closed for 60 years, it was closed for 60, 55 years. In the cellar of the synagogue, they found six Torah scrolls. So I was very moved and I asked, are there any Jews from that time in your area? And he said, yes, there are a few. My request was that when I come out of there with this Torah scroll that we brought, the new one, have these six of them at least come with these six Sefer Torahs, these six Torah scrolls, have them walk towards me. And the Torah scrolls, the old Torah scrolls, will greet this new Torah scroll. This was 15 years ago. So I was there yesterday. The mayor, a non-Jew, agreed to the request of a few Jews who researched into the question, who were the Jews of Naimachem? They did a research about who they were, when they were killed in the Holocaust. And on the wall of the uh, municipality, there were seven new memorial marks were put up on a wall of the municipality. Many of these people were killed in Auschwitz. Four hundred forty-nine Jews. For the first time, there was a memorial in their memory in Heimchen on the wall of the local municipality. And this non-Jew mayor stood there and said, I'm sorry, said sorry, for the fact that they were quiet back then, for the fact that they were silent. 
one of the rabbis there, one of the local rabbis, took out a document, an old document. He told the story about a non-Jew who received money for every Jew which he gave in to the Nazis. He was paid. It was a receipt. How much, say, every Jew was worth? Eight golds. Eight golds. Many non-Jews took part in this event yesterday. Even people from America, from Texas, a rabbi, from a Chabad rabbi, whose grandfather was from there. So I'm sorry I uh, can't stay because I'm very tired. I just came home this morning. So we learned from the rabbi of how to complete, and this is how we're going to complete. Uh, the last question. So many roles, so many... So many issues. Why are you uh, the uh, head, the Nasi, the president of Barkai, this important organization? I adore the two leaders of Barkai, the founders. When I was invited by them at the beginning, I, I didn't know them. I didn't know them, and believe me, since I uh, left the uh, chief rabbinin 12 years ago, I received many different uh, so different offers to be president and heads of different organizations, of different foundations, even universities and colleges. They said it would be good. For, it would be good for them if they have in his name. It would be good for the uh, fundraising. In terms of Yad Vashem, of course, this was something that I connected to. They uh, appointed me as the head of Yad Vashem, and of course I couldn't uh, say no to such a suggestion, but except for that I didn't get any other, I didn't uh, agree to any other uh, presidential or to head uh, organizations. I have organizations that I work with that are part of my uh, way in the name of uh, the, my father and my father-in-law. But that's it. But there was nothing else. And then these two founders of Barkai wrote the letter. I came to write that I'm not, uh, I'm not into that. And then they wrote a second letter. And I saw that it was coming from Modi'in. So I called my son, who was the rabbi of Modi'in. I said to him, Dudi, you know this uh, guy? Uh, rabbi Dudi said, he talked about the two of them. And so he told me that they were very, very unique. And they're working in the name of Hashem and for such a good goal, such an important goal. And if I can help them, that's what my son told me, that if I can help them, it'd be good. That rabbis will go in the right way. And that's why I agreed. Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, thank you very much.